What would happen if America's interstate highway system disappeared overnight? You might think it wouldn't be anything too serious. After all, it's just four lanes, a median, and some on and off ramps. For many of us, it's simply a way to take a vacation or visit family, but for the government, it's a $46 billion per year investment. In fact, if you got rid of the entire interstate highway system, the economic consequences would be worse than reliving the Vietnam War. Experts reckon that the US economy would suffer a loss of almost $620 billion if we lost the interstate highway system overnight. For context, that is a loss five times greater than it cost us for our involvement in the Vietnam War. And unfortunately for us, funding for this superhighway system is already so critical that it may one day be impossible for us to keep it unless we raise the gas prices. Hello people of the internet, I'm Nico, a young adult who spent most of his time reading multiple government reports on the economics of the interstate highway system rather than going out with friends. Um, yeah, if it sounds like I'm regretting this, uh, it, yeah, you bet your bucket I am. I'm hoping this video makes me feel otherwise. First off, we need to take a look at how the interstate highway system came to be. It all starts in 1919 with a guy named Dwight. He, along with some colleagues, set off from Washington DC in an entourage of 79 vehicles on a simple mission, reach the west coast, and report on the journey. Over the next two months, Dwight and his crew would crawl across the country in their military trucks at an average speed that rivaled pedestrians walking to the store. But eventually, after 62 days on, and sometimes off of the road, the remainder of the original 78 vehicle convoy made it to San Francisco and went on to report that the journey was unideal to put it mildly. Dwight, the lieutenant colonel tasked with writing the report, went on with his military career eventually overseeing operations against Nazi Germany during World War II. During his time there, he observed the simple genius of the Autobahn system, which allowed for quick and efficient movement of troops. Recognizing both its military and civilian applications, Dwight, whom you might have guessed by now had the last name Eisenhower, went on to become President of the United States and heavily pushed for a similar federal highway system to that of Germany. Following failed attempts from the 1940s to get such a project approved, Eisenhower succeeded where others failed in securing funding for America's most influential project ever, which he did by increasing the tax on gasoline, and herein lies the problem we are facing today. Today, the interstate highway system is still mostly paid for through the gasoline tax, and over the years the tax did increase to match the increasing costs of maintaining the infrastructure until it hit its peak in 1993 at 18 cents per gallon. The only change since then was when Joe Biden suspended the gasoline tax entirely for three months in an attempt to bring the costs down. Now you may think that's because that's all that's needed to maintain the interstate highway system. I mean, surely government officials wouldn't let the entire fund needed to maintain these super highways get depleted. There's no real easy way to say this, so I'll just give it to you straight. We pretty much ran out of money in 2021. So how did this happen? How come we are just bleeding cash and we're not doing anything about it? Little asterisk right there. We are, but it's a band-aid over a gaping wound kind of solution. Occasionally, the highway fund gets an allowance from its rich dad, the treasury, and it got one most recently in 2021. Coincidentally, that is exactly when the Congressional Budget Office projected the highway fund to be completely empty. But of course, the Treasury stepped in with $118 billion, so now we have until 2028 to figure out a solution. So naturally, that begs the question, what is the best solution? Simply put, we can either put more money in or spend less. If we go for the option of putting more money into the fund, which is the better option in my opinion, we have a few ways to go about this. The crudest solution would be simply to just make gas guzzling muscle cars and pickup trucks and completely eliminate electric vehicles. Now, to certain people who likely have more right-leaning political views, this sounds like a great idea. Shoot, I couldn't admit this to someone like Greta Thunberg, but I kind of like the idea myself. 
However, seeing that this would likely incentivize more car-centric infrastructure in America, and considering that that is just about the last thing that we need, it's actually a terrible idea. So instead, I would be more in favor of the other most obvious option, which is to increase the gas tax just like every other developed nation on Earth has done. Countries like Germany, France, and England, to name a few, tack on roughly $2.80 per gallon to cover the costs of their infrastructure. Compared to our 18.4 cents per gallon of gasoline, this may seem absurd even with their high-speed rail and public transit systems that require funding. But when you realize that we too pay for our high speed, okay, not high speed, but Amtrak rail and public transit systems with our highway fund, it turns out that we are the absurd ones. Now, it may surprise you to learn this, but we wouldn't even have to raise the tax on gasoline by that much. The Congressional Budget Office estimates that increasing the tax by just 15 cents would completely eliminate the fund's shortfalls and result in an extra $140 billion of funding by 2030. Now, this does have some consequences, namely that it would decrease the amount of taxable income for individuals and businesses. It could also stretch the budgets of low-income families to or past the breaking point, and with no alternative modes of transport like you often see in Europe, those families would be completely stuck. So if we were to go with that route, we would need to make a lot of legal changes that focus on removing car-centric infrastructure and instead focus on public transit projects and walkability. One of the other options is to impose new taxes in other areas, like say on vehicle miles traveled, shipments made by truck, or on electric vehicles. Now, these would likely have similar effects as increasing the tax on gasoline, but it would also add on some uncalled for complexity. While these taxes could bring in billions of much needed dollars to the fund, the process of setting up these taxes would likely be too expensive and time consuming to solve the immediate crisis. The final option would be taking money from the treasury, but this should not even be seriously considered as that money goes to things like education, emergency services, and other vital government services that really do not need budget cuts. Ideally though, we would use some combination of the aforementioned ideas. I think a tax on electric vehicles should be integrated as heavy vehicles cause the most damage to roads and EVs are notoriously heavy. Also considering the fact that they don't need gasoline and don't pay for roads aside from the taxes on the tires they use, it would be good for them to pay their fair share. Then, and this will be received with some controversy, we should increase the tax on gasoline. Inflation has made the original 18 cent tax worth less and less over the years, and with increasing construction and repair costs, there needs to be more money coming into the fund, and we can't just take that from the treasury's general fund. With that though, we should be focusing more of the budget on public transit projects as these are far more financially solvent. I argue this not necessarily because of the transit system's cost, but because of how communities shape around public transit and the infrastructure costs associated with those more human-scale communities. The automotive industry put America into this position of being unable to pay for all the car-centric infrastructure. Maybe it's time we start taking the land given to the car and give it back to those who really matter, the people of this country. Thank you so much for watching. If you want to see more videos about how the automotive industry impacts our lives today, then consider subscribing. It's free and you can always change your mind later. If you want to learn the full story about how the automotive industry undermined America, then I recommend this video here. Until next time, people of the internet, peace out.